chapter 7 tonight. John chapter 7, continuing through the book of John. And we'll go ahead and start reading in verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Now, right here when it says his brethren, I don't know if this means his actual brothers, or if this is talking about maybe his you know, extended family, relatives, cousins, or if it's even talking about maybe just the people of Nazareth, the people that he was from. Yay. But either way, we see that his brethren did not believe in him. We see too that in, whenever you read through the Gospels that um, in Nazareth, Jesus wasn't very well received there. That's where he said a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. And so Jesus, he struggled many times getting people to believe that knew him growing up. And I think there's a reason for that. We'll cover a little more later. It obviously was not Jesus' fault. You would think the place where Jesus grew up would be the first place that would have accepted him. You would think people would have noticed there's something different about that child. And, and remember the story, I might refer to it later, where when he was 12 years old, he was in the temple and everybody was blown away by the questions he was asking and his understanding. It's like no 12-year-old should be this wise. No 12-year-old should be that smart. And there was a reason that he was that smart. We'll see that here in a little bit. But I personally believe here in this passage, so it says that his brethren didn't believe in him. But notice how they told him in verse uh, 3, they're telling him to part, go hence into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou doest these things, show thyself to the world. It's saying, if, if you're for real, go into Judea. Go into the bigger populations. Go show yourself to the world. That's what people do who want to be made known. Jesus is obviously claiming that he's the Messiah to these people. He had done it before. And like, if you're the Messiah, go tell the masses. Now, can anybody think why they would want him to do that? And I, I, I hope I'm not reading into this. I hope I'm not wrong. But I've got an opinion on why they want him to do this. So picture this, okay? You've got Jesus Christ and he's there with his own family. And is he's claiming to be the Messiah. And they don't want to, you you would think his brothers especially would have noticed that there's something really different about him. You know, the fact that you know he never got spanked growing up, where all the rest of them did. You know, he you know they he never lied or fought or, you know, told a lie. On one of them, he never did those things. But yet, we see there. there I think, and I believe there's a very clear reason for it. They are telling him, if this is true, go tell the masses. Go out there now. If if they didn't really believe him, wouldn't they have said, you know what? Let's just keep this between us. But I personally believe the reason that they did that is they wanted to see how everyone else would respond. You know, if everyone else agreed, then they would too. And isn't that what people do whenever you actually challenge them on something? You know, people, they just don't want to take a stand on anything. Everybody wants to just follow the masses. People will follow the masses off a cliff. People literally are going to follow the masses into hell. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. May there be which go in there at. Most people decide what they're going to do based on what other people are doing. They watch the news. What's the news media saying? what seems to be the majority opinion, and that's the way they want to go. And then you've got the knuckleheads out there, you know, that just kind of want to go against everyone. And sometimes that's a good thing. But yet, in this story, I believe these people, they, were, they weren't going to go out on a limb and join him early. You know, let's see, if the masses join you, I'll join you too. You know, when I first started studying a lot of the stuff about end times, when I would talk to a lot of people about what I was seeing... You know, it was like they, they would kind of say the same thing. Well, you know, go talk to this person. Go, go talk to this preacher. You know, well, no, look, I just showed you what the Bible says. What do you have to say about what the Bible said? Well, let me wait and find out what everybody else does. 
And if everybody else gets on board, I'll get on board too. Isn't that how most people are? That's how a lot of preachers are. And that's how his own brethren were. And so look at verse 6. And there's a reason for that. I mean, Jesus is on, he's getting persecuted right now. He's being attacked. We see that, you know, the Jews were, they sought to kill him. And so they're probably thinking too, if we accept you as the Messiah, well, then we probably should tell other people that you're the Messiah too. But if we do that, they're wanting to kill you. They're going to want to kill us too. And so they're trying to keep the target off their back. So here they are. They're not willing to support Jesus. And so verse 6, it says, Then said Je- Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto the, this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, they then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said he is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit, no man spake openly of him, for fear of the Jews. You all see what, what's going on here. So Jesus, he tells them, go ahead and go up to the feast. I'm not going to go yet. And when he's telling them, you know, my time has not yet come. It, it was his, his time to, I mean, really reveal himself as the Messiah wasn't there. And when he said, your time is all way ready. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if that was him saying, you know, hey, you can go out and proclaim. You can go out and tell others about me like John the Baptist. I, I'm not for sure what all that involves there. But I do see here that in this story, he's got like, you know, his brethren, it's almost like they're afraid to go there. You know, there, you remember the feast of tabernacles is going on. That was the feast where they would kind of look back and they would remember how they used to be strangers and pilgrims wandering in the wilderness. And they would go and they would dwell in tabernacles. They would go, uh, they would go stay uh, around Jerusalem. And so here in the story, we see that the people though, you know, you got the Jews, they're looking for him. They're expecting Jesus to come. And they're thinking, we're going to find him and we're going to kill him. And it says in verse 13, you know, howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. People were talking about him. There was a stir. People had seen some of the works that Jesus had done. They'd seen the miracles. So people were talking about it, but they were kind of being hush-hush because nobody wanted to be associated with them. Just kind of, they're being pretty cowardly. And you know what? Isn't that what the world does? They try to intimidate us into silence. Yes? That's right. That's right. And you know what? I mean, part I say this all the time, but part of being a Christian is we are supposed to be spreading the gospel. But what is the new thing that we're all told? You no, know, you've got to keep your religion to yourself. You know, this is a private thing. When we go and we knock on people's doors, you know, they'll be like, well, you know, I think this is very personal. I think this is private. And, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't go around spreading my beliefs and shoving them down other people's throats. Well, then you're not a Christian because that's what we do. All right. You know, we go and we spread the gospel and we're going to preach the truth. And part of preaching the truth is exposing the lies. And so, uh, you know, but at the same time, the world wants us to be quiet about it. Now, you can have your religion. Just be quiet. Keep it to yourself. And if you don't keep it to yourself, they try to persecute you. And you got the people that are out there and they're trying to attack. They, you know, they try to attack, trying to keep us silent. You know, you've got the people that don't like churches like ours that, you know, we put our sermons online and try to get people all over to listen to those things, just trying to spread our influence. No, you keep it to yourself. And even a lot of pastors, you know, you know, we just need to keep these things to ourselves. We just need to keep everything within the four walls of our church. And no, I think we need to be spreading what we're doing all over the place. I think we need to tell as many people as we can. I personally think that our church services are a very small part of what we do. I think a lot of what we should be doing is outside these walls. Telling as many people as we can. Not This isn't just a private social club. And But yet people are they're, they're being silent. And... That's what's going on here because people are scared. There was the pressure. You know, the religious people were trying to uh, shut everybody down. And, you know, the world, you know, it, it'll, well, look what it says in uh, verse 
12. It says, And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said he is a good man. Others said nay, but he deceived the people. You know, there, there's a mixed reports going out. People are, you know, people are lying about him. People are trying to put Jesus Christ down. And that, you know, that's what the world's doing today. You know, the world's constantly trying to misrepresent what we believe and misrepresent what we, uh, you know, what we teach. And they're going to lie. And you know what? We've just got to overcome that. We've just got to, you know, tell, keep telling the truth. We've got to shine as a light. And so look at verse 14. It says, Now about the fe- uh, midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory, uh, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So right here we see that when Jesus was on earth, he was constantly just he's glorifying the Father. I mean, here he is, he's God in the flesh. He's the Son of God, but yet he's, all, he's constantly pointing to the Father. I mean, you see all the miracles that he would do. And, you know, he, once again, just pointing everybody to the Father. Just, I mean, all glory to the Father. That's completely opposite of what most people try to do today and throughout history when they're trying to start a movement, when they're trying to get a following. It's usually all about themselves, but Jesus didn't do that. He constantly glorified the Father. And notice how it mentions in verse 16, or on verse 15, you know, they're like, how know what this man letters? You know, how is he, does he have so much understanding of the Scriptures? Kind of the same thing like we saw when he was 12 years old. And this is just kind of a side note here. And, and, uh, but this is a very important lesson that we can learn when it comes to learning the Scriptures, okay? Because let's just be honest, how many in here have ever struggled understanding something in the Bible? All right? There's lots of things that we struggle to understand. Well, do you realize one of the reasons a lot of the Bible is hard to understand? It's because of our sin nature. Okay? And not that our sin nature makes us dumb, but it's that our sin nature, it causes us to not want to accept what's plainly there sometimes. You know, you got, you know, it's like, you know, we say we want to be close to God. But then, but here's the thing. We know if we get too close to God, he's going to start pointing out sins in our life. You know, when was the last time you read the Bible just asking God to show you something in your life that you need to get rid of? Uh, we don't do that, do we? You know, a lot of times we look, we're looking for loopholes. We're looking for excuses. You know, we're looking for a way to justify what we do. Isn't that, isn't that what our human nature wants to do? And so it's real easy for us to read the Scriptures and be like, yeah, you know, that, that's not what that means. Well, that was to the Jews. Well, then all of a sudden we're dispensationalists. You know, that was to the Jews. You know, that was Old Testament. You know, that doesn't apply, that doesn't apply to us today. Yeah, we're dispensationalists when it suits us. <laughs> and, but, the, you know, that, but that sin nature that we have, it causes us to sometimes turn away from the light. It causes us to miss things that should be really clear. And when we read the Bible... It is so important that we read the Bible and not with a high IQ and with a ton of education, but with a pure heart, with a heart that's right with God. I think it would be a good thing for people before they read the Bible to pray. And if we could honestly say, Lord, show me the truth, I think we'd find out a lot of things. And so Jesus, understand, even though he's God, he still had to learn just like you and I. He had to be taught. He had, he had to learn how to talk. He had to, you know, they had to potty train him. They had to do all those things. But imagine how much better he would have learned because of the fact that he didn't have a sin nature. Because since he didn't have a sin nature, you know he didn't struggle with laziness. Isn't that our problem a lot of times? We're lazy. You know, you know Jesus didn't sit around as a kid all day playing video games and watching TV. All right? you know, I know they didn't have him back then. But you know, we all, you know, I'm sure throughout time there have been the things that people waste their time on. There was a lot in the book of Proverbs about being slothful and about laziness. There's all kinds of things. People struggled with that in the Bible. They had their things 
that they did that were a waste of time, that were good for nothing, that dumbed the people down. And, but Jesus, He didn't struggle with those things. How much stuff did we miss out on in school did we not learn because, you know, we were distracted by something sinful. You were more interested in a girl that was in the class instead of listening to your teacher. You know, you were more interested in getting away with something than obeying the rules. Imagine if you were a perfect child, how much smarter you would be, how much more you would learn. And so I do believe that Jesus obviously had greater understanding than everyone because of the fact that he was God, but yet, theoretically speaking, if, you know, obviously this is impossible, but if there was a way to, when you had a baby, to remove sin from them, we would all see them as geniuses by the time they were a young age. Because our sin nature constantly gets in the way of things. And it slows us down. And here we have Jesus, who's a carpenter's son from Nazareth. He is not somebody that's going to be one of the educated people. He was not a scribe. He was not a Pharisee. He wasn't somebody that should have known a ton about the Scriptures. But he did. Because he didn't have that sin nature like you and I do. And so we do, but we do, we struggle understanding the scriptures because we're just not willing to accept the truth. You know, I think about just some of the things in, in my past, how long it took me to come to grips with some things because I was worried about making people mad. Jesus never worried about that stuff. I was worried about, you know, you know, alienating family. Jesus wasn't worried about that. His own family didn't even believe in him, but we let those things get in the way all the time. Uh, this will get me kicked out of the club. This will make me unpopular. We're constantly thinking about those things and it slows us down. And if we would just read our Bibles with a pure heart, right with God, I mean, and 100% willing to accept whatever the Holy Spirit teaches us, I think we would learn a lot more. But you know what? If we're not willing to accept the simple things, if we're not willing to get some of those sins out of our life that the Bible teaches us about, why is God going to show us the deeper things? Why would He share those with us? As a pastor, you know, I mean, I, I want to have interesting sermons. I mean, I, I, you know, it's always my desire to preach that message on a subject that just enlightens everyone. I mean, that just makes the light bulb start popping up above people's heads. I always want to do that, but if I'm going to be able to do that, I've got to have the help of the Holy Spirit. And why would the Holy Spirit help me Pull these things from the scriptures if I'm not willing to accept other things. It's not the way, it's, not, it's just not going to work. I can go read books by all the smart people that are out there. I can go to Bible college and get a master's degree and a doctor's degree. But if I'm not willing to accept the simple things, God's not going to reveal the deeper things to me. And I will. I will have to resort if I'm going to. If it's my goal to convince people I'm smart. And listen, I want people to think I'm smart. Okay, that's why I started. One of the reasons I let my wife talk me into growing this beard. I was going to see if it made me look smarter. I don't think it has. So I'm going to have to figure out something else. But uh, it, you know, I, I do. I want people to think that. But you know what? I I, can, I got two choices. I can either let the Holy Spirit teach me, which means I'm going to have to accept whatever He shows me, or I got to start reading all the books, you know, by the intellectual crowd that unfortunately I'm afraid are way off on the scriptures that I mean, that are clearly have gone into apostasy, but a lot of people look at them and they think they're really smart and I don't, I don't believe that's what God wants. And so we, but we need to understand that yes, Jesus understood a lot about the scriptures and understood them great because he was God, because he was the word of God. But just the fact we could be so much like him in that area if we would just be honest, if we would just be willing to accept whatever the Bible had to teach us, why wouldn't God share those things with us? If we're, if we're, if we're, will, if we're going to accept anything, I, do, I believe God will show you. He'll show you everything. But don't get hung up. Don't get so attached to some sin that you end up hitting a dead end. And your walk with Christ. And you hit a dead end in your growth. And I'm afraid that's where a lot of churches are at. It's like they've hit a dead end. A lot of preachers that hit a dead end. A lot of guys after Bible college, I don't think they ever learn a thing. It's like a dead end. 
Why? Because you know what? God showed them something that He wanted them to believe. He wanted them to understand. He wanted them to teach. And they said, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, you're not going to go on to the next class then until you, until you accept that. And so, but Jesus didn't have any of that trouble. And, we, and so we've got to keep our sinful flesh out of the way. You know, we're more likely to know the truth when we're in the will of God. And, you know, and we, we can't do like most people are trying to do today. Use the Word of God to try to lift ourselves up. Jesus didn't even do that. You know, you don't, you'd think, you know, Jesus, He could have used some Old Testament Scriptures to really build Himself up. You know, He could have used that verse, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government should be upon His shoulder. And His name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He could have told people, call, call me that. I am that. But he, that's not how he did it, did he? He was constantly pointing to the Father instead of himself. Because once again, like I mentioned Sunday night, we're not trying to get to Jesus, we're trying to get to the Father. But we get to the Father through Jesus Christ. And so, look what it says in verse uh, 19. It says, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast the devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? You know, just completely in denial. It says many times, they sought to kill him. They wanted him to die, and they're acting like he's got a devil. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and y'all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Okay, what's he talking about here? Well, he meant, okay, Sabbath day, you weren't supposed to do any work, but there was another law that says on the eighth day, you're supposed to be circumcised. So what if somebody is born on a Friday? Well, then that means the next Saturday, they have to, they're going to have to get circumcised. And that's on the Sabbath. So, which law are we going to break? Okay? And, you, you know, and, I, and I don't believe, you know, when they circumcised somebody on the Sabbath, they were breaking the law. But at the same time, they were kind of accusing Jesus of breaking the law because he healed a man on the Sabbath day. In the previous chapters, he would do these miracles on the Sabbath day. Once again, that miracle, that, you know, the whole thing, idea of the Sabbath, it was for man. It was a help to them. And here we'd have Jesus, I mean, healing people of their infirmities on the Sabbath, literally making their lives easier appropriately on the Sabbath. And they're wanting to kill him because they had made such a big deal out of that. And he's saying, judge not according to appearance, might appear like I'm breaking the law, but you know what? Judge righteous judgment. What's he saying? You know, have you know, let's use some common sense, folks. You know, let's have a balanced approach here. And one because and one of the things that we do, I'm afraid, sometimes as Christians and Baptists are, are known for doing this sometimes, but many times we turn God's laws into burdens that actually hurt people that actually make it harder for them to be a good Christian. All right? you know, for example, you know, we need to prioritize. Okay? I believe church attendance is important, but you know what? If your wife's in the hospital having a baby on a Sunday, husbands, you ought to be with your wife in the hospital while she's having that baby. You know what? Skip church that day. Oh, we're not supposed to skip church. Yeah, but you know what? You're also supposed to be there for your wife. Okay? You're her only husband. You're the only one that can do that. All right? you know, I, you know, and people do. Sometimes they'll make such a big deal out of a rule or a law that they end up making things worse in another area. And that's just, that's not, these, these laws, they're not made to be broken, but they were actually there, they're there to help. And when we make them a burden to where it makes it harder for people to do other things that are right, to do the, maybe in the bigger things, more important things, we're kind of defeating the purpose. Matthew 23, 4 says, talking about the Pharisees, it says, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Okay, a lot of times preachers will do that. Okay, you know, it's, and listen, 
I might shoot myself in the foot saying this, all right? But, you know, I, you know we, we haven't had any revival meetings since we've been here. But, you know, a lot of times churches will have these revival meetings, you know, Sunday through Friday, you know, every night. I'm all, I'm all for those things. But, man, they will really put the pressure on people to be there every night. And sometimes people, you know, have jobs where they have to get up really early in the morning and they'll have them there late every night and they got to get up early every morning. And I'm not trying to make excuses for people skipping church and everything, but you know what? Sometimes pastors make church a huge burden. And then what's disgusting is a pastor. Goes, you know, I don't have any problem coming here every night. Well, yeah, this is your job. You're going to sleep in tomorrow morning. Not only are you going to sleep in tomorrow morning, but after you get up at 10 o'clock, you're going to go spend the rest of the day with the guest speaker golfing while the rest of us are out working our behinds off. And then, you know, if we show up a little late or something, because we had to work a little late, you know, you're going to chastise us, you know, because we just didn't make it to the Friday night because we passed out from exhaustion, you know, but you didn't have any problem with it because, yeah, this is your job. Yeah, you get to sleep in. You get to play golf all day. And listen, folks, that kind of thing goes on. That's what happens most of the time when they have these revival meetings. Guest speaker comes. Him and the preacher go golfing all week long. You know, they, they, they're they not out soul winning all day. They're not out working. They're out golfing, eating at fancy restaurants, being big shots. And then they chastise their people because they couldn't make it every night of the service because... Now, you, you, made, you made the pastor look bad. I've been telling, you know, Dr. Big Shot that I, you know, that I got to come in, you know, how great our church is and how big our numbers is. And like most pastors, I exaggerated. I stretched things a little bit. And then y'all, y'all made me look bad. Well, you made yourself look bad playing golf and eating all day long while the rest of us worked. And you know what? And, and preachers do, man, they will guilt trip people. And they will make their lives miserable. And then it's like, you know, I'm all for giving too. I'm all for, you know, giving. But it's like, you know, I, I've known of some preachers that have let people get extra mortgages on their house so they can give big offerings to the church when they're trying to do some project. So they can build some palace that will make them look good whenever they have the guest speakers come in and get the get people in financial trouble. I mean so I have heard of some very shady deals. Preachers that have manipulated their churches and or people in their church to, I mean, giving big money and these people getting in trouble financially. And I'm telling you, that kind of stuff's wicked. And when we are, when we're turning these things and uh, causing burdens that are grievous to be born and laying them on people's shoulders while we're being pathetic and lazy ourselves, I'm telling you folks, That is a Pharisee right there. And there are a lot of Pharisees pastoring churches today. And you know what? You want to know one of the reasons we haven't had any revivals that I've learned since I've been here? Because I've been having to work most of this time and I don't want to have church every night when I have to get up at 2.30 every morning. And you know what? It's been eye-opening to me because it's like, you know what? If If I don't want to do it, if I can't do that... I doubt the rest of the church is going to want to do that. I know not everybody gets up at 2.30, but it's, it's, it's hard. I just, and I can't do it right now. Oh, you know, people ought to take vacation during the week of revival. Okay, you know, how much vacation do some of us have? You know, don't all, we don't always get that much. And, uh, you know, it's just, once again, just putting burdens on people that are just unfair. That's what the Pharisees did. You know, 1 John chapter 5 says, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. You know, the commandments of God, they make our lives better. The sins, the things that we harp on around here, if you get those things out of your life, it's going to make your life better. It's going to make your life easier. And yet, some churches, man, they are, and these preachers, they make, it's like, they make everybody miserable. And you go to these churches, and the people are miserable. They do. They drag their carcasses in the church, and you can tell the people don't want to be there. You can t- you, you can't. You can tell we're here because we have to be here, 
And the churches are the worst about that. It's a lot of the bigger churches. They have Christian schools. You know, they've got all these things and they, they require their people. If you're going to be in the school, you know, if you're going to be on staff, they got a lot of staff, you know, you have to be here every service and they do, man, they, they wear these people out and they, they have these meetings all the time. And when I was at that stupid anti-Anderson conference, I felt sorry for those people coming out every night because those were long services. I mean, the one, it was like two and a half hours and you can just see the people dying in their pews. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, man, these poor folks that have to get up in the morning, early in the morning and go to work so they can come back the next day just because this guy's got a vendetta against another preacher. And you could see that they were, they were just completely, they were completely gone. Everybody wonders how he got away with preaching some of the crazy heresies he did. It's because everybody was sleeping. You know, nobody was paying attention. It was just like, is he done yet? Is he done yet? You know, everybody was too busy looking at their watch. That's why nobody noticed it. You know, if you, and I learned a great lesson. If I ever want to teach a major heresy, I just got to preach a really, really long message and make it towards the end when I've already lost everybody. And then, <laughs> and then nobody will notice it. But I, I'm telling you, I think that's what happened there that night. But, but commandments of God, they're not grievous. It'll, it'll make, it'll make you, better, you better. It'll make you happier. It'll make your life easier. And that's just not happening in a lot of places. And so we, do, we, need to, we need to prioritize, okay? And church attendance is important, but don't come when your wife's having a baby, okay? Church attendance is important, but don't come when you have pneumonia and you got 104 fever and you've got the plague and you'll know, go spread it around to the rest of the church, all right? You know, it's important, but prioritize, folks. Use common sense. Church is it's, it's supposed to be a blessing. And if we are, and you always have that one person in the church, I don't know if we have it here or not. I'm not, I'm not thinking about anybody right now. But you'll, do, you'll have that one person that when they are deathly ill will come dragging their carcass into church. Uh, you know, uh, you might not want to shake my hand. I got, you know, I got the flu. I got the plague. I got Ebola. You know, and, but I'm not going to miss church. And then those people too, they come in like a martyr and then they just happen to notice everybody who didn't make it that night. I could make it. I don't understand why they can't make it. Well, you know what? You shouldn't have made it. You should have stayed home. You should have took care of yourself. You know, if it's that big of a burden, you know, don't do it. I said, I might be shooting myself in the foot. Y'all are not going to show up Sunday. Thinking you got a you know, great excuse somewhere. But listen, you know, if you have some, a legit excuse, then it's, it's legit. All right. Just, but you know, don't go making things up. All right. It's these people who miss because of the hangnails and stuff. You know, those are the ones that we're always getting on, but we need to choose our battles wisely. You know, we, we do, you know, I, I believe in keeping the least commandments. I believe in teaching people to keep the least commandments, but you know what? There's just some things that, you know, we're not going to have a huge fight about. You know, we're not going to, we're not, I hope, you know, we're not going to have a big, huge discussion on the extra individual that's mentioned in the genealogy in Luke that's not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. What's that guy doing there? I have no idea, and I really don't care. All right, you know, I mean, is that a mistake? You know, we're not going to worry about that. We're not going to worry about genealogies. We're not going to we're not going to fight a big battle over that. I'm not worried about it one bit. And and people do though. They will they will pick some of these little things make a mountain out of a molehill and just use it to cause division and cause trouble. We can't do that. So verse tw- look at verse 25. It says, Then uh, said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knows whence he is. They didn't think he could be the Messiah because their thinking was wrong. You know, they, they had an idea of how things were going to play out. When it didn't play out exactly right, they're like, no, this, this can't be him. And, and so, uh, look at verse 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and you know whence I am. I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man doth, hath done? Then the, uh, the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. 
And the Pharisees and the chief uh, priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And whither I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither shall he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that he said, Ye shall seek me, and ye shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Well, Jesus is telling them he came, he, he's been telling them he came from God, uh, and basically he would be going back to God, is what he was saying. But they didn't understand that saying because they had no faith. Okay? And once again, this is another example of Jesus kind of speaking a hard saying, kind of speaking in a parable because they weren't willing to accept the truth. They would not believe him. That is the first thing we need to do. If you're not going to have faith, you're not going to understand the Bible. If you're not willing to obey the Bible, you're not going to understand the Bible. Jesus knew the hearts of the people. And because he knew their hearts and they had no interest in listening to anything he said, he told them the truth, but he told them in a way that was difficult to understand. And that's the thing, once again, if we're going to understand the Bible, we have got to be willing to be obedient and we've got to have some faith. There's going to be some things that we don't completely get, but we've got to accept it by faith. And look at verse 37. In the last day, the, uh, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given them, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. We so once again, Jesus, he's speaking figuratively here. But he tells you know, come unto me if you thirst, come unto me and drink, and out of your belly will flow rivers of water. And then it's added in here by John that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And we've already talked about this before, but when we take the way we take up, or when we take up the water of life, we receive the Holy Spirit of God. And we'll never thirst again. We'll never have a need to take that drink again. You don't ever need to get re-saved. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. And so the Holy Spirit, you know, in the Old Testament, because it mentions how, um, you know, they that believe on Him should receive the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Okay? And back in the Old Testament, you'd see many examples of the Holy Ghost coming on somebody, the Holy Spirit coming on someone, but then it would go too. And this whole thing of being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that was a new thing that happened after Christ. Time on earth. It had not been given yet. And so there was a lot of things about that that they didn't understand. And there was a lot of... Jesus had a lot to say about that, and we'll see a lot more of it later when we get into the book of John. But once again... They didn't understand any of those things he said about the Holy Spirit until they actually experienced it, until it actually happened, until the book of Acts. They, they clearly did not understand a lot of things about the Holy Spirit. And so notice in verse uh, 40, well, I lost my spot. Uh, verse 40, look at verse 40. It says, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying said of a truth, this is a prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then, with, uh, then came the officers of the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never a man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But the pe this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet, and every man went unto his own house." Notice here, they start bringing up things from the Scriptures to prove that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. And notice one of the things they brought up is that He's supposed to come from Bethlehem. But wait a minute. Jesus did come from Bethlehem, didn't He? But nobody asked Him about that, did they? Nobody went and asked Him, Hey, Jesus. Because the Bible doesn't say 
that he would have, you know, was, would have been a resident of Bethlehem. But it said that you know, he would come from Bethlehem. And he was born in Bethlehem, wasn't he? Why? Because he was of the house and lineage of David. Things we need to understand about him being from Nazareth, because people were confused by that. You know, Nazareth was in the northern part of Israel, around Galilee, and the people who were from David, because it mentioned he's supposed to be from David, they were from Judea, from the southern kingdom. And that's where Bethlehem was, in the southern kingdom. But, and remember it, in Luke chapter 2, we see that the reason Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. And that was where he had to go to be taxed. But yet, but he lived up in Nazareth. So the people didn't understand that. Because he lived in Nazareth, they knew his family. They just assumed that that's where he came from. But the truth is, they were actually right in what they were saying because he was the seed of David. He did descend from David. He was born in Bethlehem, but nobody asked him. They, they didn't even bother checking up. And then, and, you know, and I believe they didn't ask because they didn't want to know the truth. And that, a lot of times when people don't ask questions, it's because they don't want to know the truth. But, you know, another thing, too, that we see here, you know, sometimes we find out we don't know as much about the Bible as we think we do. These people all thought they were real smart, and they obviously knew a few things. They got that verse from Micah where it talked about him coming from Bethlehem. They got those prophecies about him being of the seed of David. They got those things, but they're like, search, look in the Scriptures. He's not going to come from Nazareth. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to come from there. But notice, or let me show you some verses. There's actually some things in the Old Testament that they missed. It was it actually is it, you know they're saying you know go search and look. Preachers say that all the time. Yeah, you know, show me the Bible. Well, they're assuming you're not going to look. They're assuming you don't know. You know, a lot of them, you know, people do. They think they know. Nowhere in the Bible, you know, does it say you know does it say that? Well, yeah, actually, there's plenty of places in the Bible where it says that. But if you dare say anything to them, they flip out on you. But you people do that all the time, and they're kind of doing that. Nowhere in the Bible do you see he's going to come from Nazareth. That's just not there. He's from Nazareth. Therefore, he cannot be the Christ. He cannot be the Messiah. But look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 13. They missed something. Jesus, um, you know, Nazareth, once again, it was around, you know, the Sea of Galilee. And look, uh, and look at what it says. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, "The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death." Light is sprung up. Y'all see that? Actually, there was a prophecy in Isaiah about him coming from around that region, about his ministry being in that area. Much of what we see in the Bible about Jesus and his miracles that he did, it was in that area around Galilee. Not so much Nazareth. Once again, they struggle there because a prophet is not without honor save in his own country. But Jesus, it was prophesied that not that the Messiah was going to come from there, but he was going to be doing a work in that area. They should have been looking for that. They should have expected that. Be like, they should have been like, you know what it does say in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, that he would do a work in this area, but it also says he would come from Bethlehem. Where were you born? They didn't, ask the right, they didn't ask any of the right questions because they didn't know the Bible as well as they thought they did, and they weren't willing to accept the truth. And that's where many people are at today. They never learn anything because they're not willing to accept the truth. You know, it's like, you know, you know anymore, I, just, I don't even want to talk to people. I, just, I don't even want to talk to preachers unless they give me some kind of evidence that they are willing to just believe what the Bible says. And, you know, and you, you got these people, I'm never going to change. I'm never going to change. Well, then why should I even talk to you? You know, why, why should I waste my time? You know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And the thing is, we see all the time in the Bible, and we've seen it in our own lives, where we didn't know something as well as we thought we did. But it said it very clearly in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, uh, it, says, it says, you know, that the people that walked in darkness have seen a great 
light. And they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And so ultimately, what caused them to miss the boat? Because everything that the Old Testament prophesied, it happened. And all these prophecies that they were bringing up in this passage, sure enough, actually Jesus had fulfilled. The one thing that they were using to say, nope, search, look in the Scriptures, it's not there. No, actually it is there. You're just wrong. You don't know the Bible as well as you think you do. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit's not going to reveal it to you because you're not willing to obey. Y'all are seeking to kill Him. Y'all are just looking for a reason to kill Jesus. You're not willing to accept the truth and He's not going to show you truth. And why is that? Why is it that some people seem to miss it? You know, And ultimately what caused these people to miss the boat, it was not their poor understanding of the Scriptures. These people were probably pretty smart. People today who just can't seem to get certain things in the Bible, it's not because they're idiots. It's not because they went to a bad Bible college. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with that. The problem is they have a heart problem. If you don't know the Scriptures, it's because you have a heart problem. Look what it says in John chapter 3 and verse 18. Because notice what it said there. The title of my message tonight is Jesus Christ, the Great Light. It was prophesied in Matthew that in that area, those who walked in darkness would see a great light. And that was Jesus Christ. Jesus was fulfilling that prophecy there in chapter 7 and nobody noticed it. Here they have, they are in an area of darkness and that great light that was prophesied is there, but they missed it. And it was not because they weren't well educated. It wasn't because they weren't necessarily looking. It was because they had a heart problem. And John chapter 3 says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You see that right there? That's why people don't get saved. That's why you can just, I mean, you can give the clearest plan of salvation to some people. You can show them that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's not of works lest any man should boast. But he that worketh not, but believeth. I still think you need to do some works. Why, why is that? You know, they've got a heart problem. They've got an evil, they've got an evil heart. And it's not that they can't see. It's just, you know what they're doing? They're turning away from that light. And anyone who does not get saved, it will be because they rejected that light. He is that light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I believe everybody in their life at some point or another, they have an, there's an opportunity, there's a time when somehow, some way, that light shines. And I believe those who go to the light. So what if they're in some foreign country? God will get a, God will get a missionary there. God, we see God did some miraculous things in the Bible to get the gospel to those people who are looking. Guys like Cornelius. Guys like the Ethiopian eunuch. God did some pretty amazing things to get people to them. You know why? Because those people were seeing that light and they were, they were going towards that light. But today... We have people that are running from the light. They can't understand the Bible because they're not willing to have faith. They're not willing to obey it. So God's, God's not going to show them. And so the problem that the Pharisees had was that their traditions were their final authority. That's all there is to it. Not the Word of God. And just like today, when you confront the religious with the Word of God, many times they won't listen just like Pharisees. And the, the Pharisees, they, did, they, they wouldn't even listen to the very Word of God. And it wasn't because Jesus spoke in parables. The disciples, you know, don't speak in parables. Why are you speaking in parables to them? Like, no, you know, make it easier for them. Jesus like, no, He knew their hearts. They, just, they weren't going to listen. They, they had a heart problem. And so if you want to understand the Bible, you need to get your heart right with God. If you want to understand the deeper things, get your heart right with God. If you want to know the truth, be obedient. Whatever He shows you, you might want to unlock the mysteries of the spiritual world. Alright, if that's your goal, alright, great goal. 
But if you're not willing to clean up your own act, if you're not willing to you know, be obedient and live a clean, decent life, if you're not willing to be a witness, why would God show you those things? The things that are crystal clear. If you're not even willing to get baptized, why would God show you those things? You need to do those things first. And when you do those things, then God will start revealing the deeper things to you. And I believe that with all my heart. And so Jesus Christ, He was that great light. Prophecy being fulfilled, and they missed it because their hearts weren't right with God. Let's make sure our hearts are right so we can see these things, so we can catch, get these truths and make sure that we, we're doing the right thing and in the will of God. So with that, let's all stand together.